That prelude was played here on May 13th, 1934. That was Mother's Day. It was also played on January 28th, 1940 by our then organist, Bob Willits. And he uh, went to a movie at the Temple Theater that Sunday afternoon after he played that. He saw Swanee. He saw Swanee. You, you have done your research. So, uh, welcome to, to First Presbyterian Church. We have a, a great worship service planned for you today. We have the commissioning of our youth for the mission trip and our leaders and friends. If you don't know Tom Boston Kemple and the patience that God has planted in that man's heart... He spent four days with a rental car company who shall go unnamed unless you want to know, <laughs> who lost our vans, had vans destroyed, gave one of our vans away, and Tom was peaceful. I think he's a Mennonite. We'll ask you to bless us and pray for us and, and to send us on our way, but we're grateful for the work that he's put into planning this trip for us. And if the kids would come up during the offering, when the ushers come forward after the final collection and, and come up as a symbol of offering your lives to God, and, and then we'll do our commissioning and your blessing. Uh, they're lining up for announcements back there, and so I'll be quick with one that I have. I am going on the mission trip with the youth. There are 27 of us going, and so I will be gone next week. Esther has emergency contacts for pastoral coverage if any is needed, and I will be on vacation the next week in Minnesota. While I am gone, they got one of the best preachers that they could get to fill the pulpit. It's, her name is Colette Stotes. If, if I'm saying that right, you've done some work with her before for worship planning and all that. She is fabulous. And so I, I wouldn't want to come on a Sunday and hear somebody that wasn't good. So we're not going to get anyone who's not good for you. So come, hear her. She's good. Um, and so blessings for while we're gone. And, and they are lining up. So who's next? Come on. I haven't done this for so long, I have to have a cheat sheet. So if I look down, that's because I'm cheating. I'm pretty sure you all know this already, but just in case it slipped your mind, I'm here to remind you, First Pres is getting a facelift, and the project is big. But just like any big project, it's going to start with a single building block. It will take many, many blocks of many, many sizes to complete. Today we want you to choose a block from the basket. Amy, Leo, Dave, you're up now. Baskets will be coming down the aisles. Please choose a block. Put it someplace special where you'll see it often. And use it to remind you to prayerfully consider what you can do for our building project. They're in the back. Sorry, Amy. <clears throat> what you can give to our building project. Our pledges, just like the blocks in the baskets, will come in all different sizes, and it will take all of them. All of our individualized, prayerful pledges to fulfill our dream. So remember, your block matters. Good morning. I have two quick announcements. The first one is this Wednesday we'll be having our meal at the Fellowship Cup and we'll be serving pulled pork sandwiches and various salads. And so we've got a lot of stuff already here uh, taken care of, but we do need two fruit salads. So if you could provide that, say maybe a serving for 15 people, two fruit salads, that'd be great. Okay. And if you want to come help, you can. It's a lot of fun. Okay, the other thing is, okay, but we are not, we're not having bleach Wednesday. Okay, so just, that was that announcement. This is a new announcement. Um, 
Vacation Bible School, August 3rd through the 7th. It's going to be a lot of fun. We have a lot of crafts. And the one craft that we're going to be working on, because it's kind of an outdoor theme, um, God's World theme, is we're going to be making um, bird, bird feeders. I know, these don't right now look like a bird feeder, but trust me, it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. And so we need maybe 15 or 20, and it could be any size, but this smaller one is pretty good because we're going to have the kids cut it out and decorate it, and it's going to be pretty neat. But I only have two, so if you guys could bring some to Esther sometime before um, Bible school, we'd really appreciate it. Okay, thank you. I'm going to turn the air down. Okay, I'd like to let down. everyone know that there's a little um, change in coffee um, and cookies today. We're actually going to move it to the fellowship hall. And today it's going to be cake and cookies. And then also, um, if you would like to come back after the forum or stay for the forum, and we're also going to be serving lunch, lots of good salads, um, sandwiches, and desserts. Thank you. A message from your 175th committee, a reminder that we really want your written contributions for the booklet we're going to be putting together. And the deadline is August 1st. So it's coming right up. 300 words or less, emailed to Esther. Thanks so much. Good morning. There were times this week when I did not feel very Mennonite-like. <laughs> uh, however, patience does pay off. And uh, I am glad to say that Enterprise Rental Company uh, came through in that I did have to remind the manager, the regional manager, and the district regional manager that the safety and success of our trip was relying on the vehicles that they provided to us. And so our 315 passenger vans are truly, God knows where, somewhere in the country, but um, they have provided four minivans to us. It gives us 28 seats for 27 participants. Uh, however, uh, we do uh, have four luggage top carriers from the Kragers, Conrads, Hagers, and Kramers that uh, will help us squeeze everything in. And um, the bottom line is that Enterprise Rental Company said because of the terrible inconvenience that, and this is why I wanted you to know their name, uh, they are providing the four minivans free of charge to us. And so um, that allows us to give a greater contribution from uh, our participant fees and from the congregation to Heifer. And so that's a blessing that will uh, pay many times over in the uh, ministry and efforts that Heifer can do with that money. Um, needless to say, I'm very excited to be taking 27 people from the congregation on a mission trip this week. Um, I, along with Karen and Trey and Leo and Maggie will be the adults providing leadership. However, we are also blessed to have three young adults who will be providing leadership as well. We have Levi Boston Kempel, Sarah Van Doren, and Ellie Conrad. And then rounding out our leadership team, we have two returning Heifer grads who will be helping us with devotions and plans and activities in Hannah Stater and Caitlin DePriest. And so that is a wonderful group of leadership to be providing uh, for the activities and experiences for our delegation of 27 going to Heifer. We are down three, uh, four on our trip, and that is because of the success of, and we share in the joy of the girls softball team here in Mount Pleasant. Uh, we could not be more proud of Callie and Annie Lichty and of Sarah Moffat for um, uh, leading the girls softball team to the state tournament this week, which will prevent their coming on the trip. But we share your joy, and we will figure out a way.
my goal is to listen to the softball game while we're traveling. And so I'm uh, looking forward to doing that so that we can cheer you on. And then uh, Jake Moffat, uh, Sarah's little brother, will be representing all of us uh, by going and being a part of the cheering section for the girls softball team. So it's quite a great week for youth ministry at our church. It's exciting to be uh, a part of it, and it is my pleasure and honor to uh, be the youth director here for you all. Thank you. Mary Beth Young wanted me to also mention the Summer Sacks program. It's a great ministry that our church does. So she said if you don't contact her, she will be hunting you down or giving you a call. So let us stand as we're able for the call to worship. From near and far we gather. Here we are no longer strangers. Let us worship God. Opening hymn is number 288. You may be seated. The call to reconciliation. We no longer regard one another from a human point of view, for Christ has died for all, to save us from sin and death. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. Holy, triune God, we confess that we have not lived for your glory. You claim us as beloved children but we do not honor your name. You call us to paths of righteousness, but we fail to follow your way. Forgive us, God of grace. Break down the walls that divide us from you and from one another, and build us up into a holy temple through Jesus Christ our Lord. assurance of pardon. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Now everything is made new. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven.
You may be seated. The prayer for illumination. Blessed are you, O God, for in your wisdom you have revealed to your people the mystery of your will. Now, by the power of your Holy Spirit, help us to hear and believe your word of truth, the good news of our salvation, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Bethany. That's a, that's a gift. I, I don't know, you couldn't see because you were playing, but everyone out here got to close their eyes for a bit and meditate and be taken away. That's a, thank you for sharing. So the disciples had been at it for some time with Jesus. They had walked from town to town proclaiming the kingdom of God, saying that the presence of God, the very presence of God from on high has come here, has come near to each of us. Imagine the sore feet and the tired bodies of a good day's work. Some scholars debate how the disciples traveled around exactly from town to town. Some think that they were driven around because they were all in one accord Pity laughs start over here with family. <laughs> but really, they had walked. They had walked sand in their sandals. And, and they, they had to be exhausted. And think about this. They were probably mentally tired too. Because along the way, Jesus was teaching them everything that he himself knew. And you know what it's like when you read a really good book or a really good article and you were just digesting it and you literally have to take a break and just sit for a minute and let it soak in. They didn't have time for that. 
They didn't have time to rest their feet or to rest their souls. The crowds kept pushing in on them. There was always someone else to be healed, something else to be cast out, someone to be fed, good news to be proclaimed. Here is how our scripture for today from the Gospel of Mark says it. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place all by themselves. But many saw them going and recognized them. And they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. As it grew late, The disciples told Jesus to send the people away so that they could go get something to eat. But they had run from faraway villages, and there was no way they could make it back in time. And so Jesus told the disciples, you give them something to eat. And so they fed 5,000 people. And immediately after that, Jesus said, get into the boat, and let's go to the other side. And after dismissing the crowds and praying on the mountain, Jesus caught up with the disciples in the boat by walking on the water. And he climbed into the boat. And when they arrived on the other side and got out of the boat, people again at once recognized them and rushed about in that whole region and began to bring their sick on the mats. And wherever they went, into villages or cities or farms. People came and brought the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might even touch the fringe of Christ's cloak. And all who touched it were healed. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most holy God, uphold me so that I might uplift thee. Amen. Jesus wanted to give the disciples a chance for a little bit of rest. He kept trying to send them away ahead of him so that they could have a chance to pray, or he would say, come away with me to a quiet place and pray. And it didn't happen. The crowds kept coming, the needs kept piling on, and it was just like life. There was always something else to do. But I want to caution us here because I think we need to be careful about how we hear this story. I have always heard this story from the time I was a young child sitting in the pew. I've always heard this story as saying the disciples didn't have time to pray. That's how I've always heard it. But that is not what is said here Jesus clearly teaches that there is more than one way to pray. There is the mountaintop type of closet prayer of solitude with God that we see Jesus have in the scripture reading when he goes up on top of the mountain to pray. And those are necessary and beneficial, but they don't always happen in life. And there is another kind of prayer that Jesus teaches about that we see active in Christ's life. It's powerful, and it is life-giving. I would call it a living prayer, an awareness, an openness. The mystics call it seeing from the third eye. The new agers call it being at one with all things. Others might say, like a Buddhist, it's like being awake. A form of prayer. Attentiveness, knowing. In this form of prayer, everything is spiritual. Everything is connected. 
There was a quote I read recently that said, Dear Lord, may I be awake and aware so that my every breath is a living prayer. See, being too busy to pray is a heresy. It's not true. We are never too busy to be awake and aware. As Jesus shows, a prayer can be a breath, a moment, a revelation, an awareness of the sacredness of the holy of life, a sunset, a child giggling, the love of a friend, the grass growing. I read a great article uh, from a scholar that I like to read sometimes named John Ortberg. And he opens with this article on prayer with some very pointed questions. He says, how many of you ever feel guilty about not praying enough? And he says, raise your mental hands. So mentally, I see a lot of hands going up, mine included. And he says, if someone were at a party and they were to ask you, how is your prayer life these days? Which, by the way, is a great way to kill a party conversation. <laughs> but what would you say? Is, is your prayer life, is the state of your prayer life determined by how often you pray? How long you pray? Is it measured by how many people you are praying for? Or how much faith you exude when you pray? Or how many of your prayers get answered? Prayer has an essential relationship to life, to the life of faith. But there is this mystery to it as well. And Ortberg says that many years ago, he read some words from a book called To Believe is to Begin to Pray that changed his understanding of how prayer works and what prayer can be. Here are what some of those words say. To believe as Jesus did doesn't just mean believing that God exists. It means to believe God is always present. That's a different level of awareness, which begins to turn all of our life, all of our actions, all of our words into a conversation with God, into a form of a living prayer. So in seminary, we would do this silly little game in the cafeteria uh, whenever it was time to pray. We would stick our thumb on the table. And the last one to stick their thumb on the table, the loser, had to pray. You'll see me do this in session meetings sometimes. <laughs> it's not true. What Ortberg says about this, because he did it too, I guess it's a common practice in, all, in a lot of seminaries, is he said, yeah, we used to do that, and then we would sit there and pray. After putting our thumbs on the table, the loser would say, dear God, we are so grateful to be in your presence and, and to share this meal today. And Ortberg says, you know, I, I wonder what God would think. Like, if it's such an honor to pray in my name, why is it the loser that gets to pray? It's as if we think that God isn't present until we pray. And then when we pray, all of a sudden, God is there. That's how we often pray, isn't it? That God is only present when we pray. But Jesus never did this. Jesus knew his father was listening, not just when he prayed, but all the time. He was aware. For Jesus, the line between praying and just speaking in God's presence thinned out to the point of disappearing. And Jesus comments on this when he is about to raise Lazarus. You remember that story? And he says, Jesus comes to the tomb, and after crying for his friend, he says, he begins to pray to God. He says, I thank you that you hear me. I know that you always hear me. But I have said this for the benefit of the people standing here. In other words, 
the goal of prayer is not to get good at prayer. It's, it's not to see who can spend the longest time in prayer or to see who can say the most words about prayer because Jesus said he doesn't like us to pray like those pagans do who like to heap up words and words and words and words and words. Uh, he says, just pray to your Father in silence. The goal isn't to pray with more certainty or greater eloquence or greater frequency. The goal of prayer is to live life and to do all we do in the joyful awareness of God's presence at all times. The goal of prayer is to become aware of the Holy Spirit indwelling with all things at all times. It is to wake up. So speaking of goals, we have set some big, hairy, audacious goals for the church. You may have heard of these goals. I call them the 50 and 5, the BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious goals of 50 new members in five years, an increase to $50,000 in local and global giving in five years, and an increase of 50 50 covenant projects like the sandwich lunches or Habitat for Humanity in the next five years. It is good to have goals because they help us see how we are doing with our mission in life. And the purpose of any goal is is the same, to have an objective on which you can focus, a goal for which you can strive. And so as a church, we have a mission and that is to glorify God and to show the love of Christ to our neighbors. And we measure that mission by meeting goals. And I'm proud of that because it leads to godly success. But we also need to set spiritual goals for your life. Now, I know many of you have all kinds of personal goals. I know some of you have very big goals in life, like cleaning out your mother's basement. (laughs) Some of you have other more lofty goals, like pursuing your education or going back to school or getting a promotion or changing the world or changing our community. And spiritual goals are no different than any other goal. It's like setting up a target for yourself, and it helps you mark the direction you are going. So what is the spiritual goal that the church wants you to have for your life? It comes from our catechism. Catechism's that little book of instructions that we get that you were supposed to read in confirmation class. And the first statement in the shorter catechism says, your chief end for being created by God is to enjoy God's creation. The first goal of your life is to wake up and enjoy. I read a quote that said, when we die and we go up to those pearly gates, the question isn't going to be, why didn't you do more? Why didn't you pray more? Why didn't you love more? Why didn't you have more faith? Those won't be the questions. The questions will be, why didn't you have more joy? I heard that, and it woke me up. All of a sudden, I started seeing things in my spiritual life in a little different way. The snuggles from Hudson. The church, being the church walking around, putting out brownies, making phone calls, planning things. God at work, a sunset, joy. Even with the loss of a dear friend and a loved one, there was joy in the midst of that grief. Friends, loving friends, hundreds of thousands of sandwiches which are in the back and you're supposed to come to lunch to eat today. Joy. That is our first goal. That is our spiritual goal, to wake up and to have joy. 
And let me close with this story that I read from the book that we're going to discuss in forum today right after church. See, I shortened announcements. So I'm making them now. Join us for forum. And you will hear about this book called Being Presbyterian in the Bible Belt. And here's a quote for it about waking up and enjoying. The author, Ted Foote, shares a story about the color purple from Alice Walker's novel, The Color Purple. He quotes the part about Celie, who was a woman beaten down by both her husband and by life circumstances. She has been despairing of ever knowing the goodness of life, being all but dead in the spirit. Then she meets another woman who has a grace-based spirituality. This woman transform the way Seeley looks at the world around her. In a letter mailed back to her sister Nettie, Seeley tells Nettie that God, God gets miffed if you walk by the color purple in a field somewhere and you don't stop and admire the beautiful flowers God has made. God according to Seely, feels shortchanged when God's people don't stop and celebrate God's relationship, evident in the ordinariness of creation and life. So my big, hairy, audacious prayer for you this week is that you may wake up and be aware and alive and enjoy the presence of God all around you, and the snuggles, the sunsets, the blessings, and the tragedies, and in all things. And as the book says, don't leave God feeling miffed because you didn't enjoy the color purple. Amen. Let us stand and and sing our hymn of response. Let us remain standing and affirm our faith from one of the questions from the catechism. How do you live for the love of God? I love because God first loved me. God loves me in Christ with a love that never ends. Amazed by grace, I no longer live for myself. I live for the Lord who died and rose again, triumphant over death for my sake. Therefore, I take those around me to heart, especially those in particular need, knowing that Christ has died for them, no less than for me. Amen. You may be seated. Please join me in prayer. 
Almighty God, who taught us to pray, not only for ourselves, but for people everywhere, hear us as we pray for others in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray that you inspire the whole church with your power, unity, and peace. Grant all who trust you may obey your word and live together in love. We pray that you lead all nations in the way of justice and goodwill. Direct those who govern us, that they may rule fairly and maintain order, uphold those in need, and defend oppressed people, so that this world may claim your true peace. Give grace to all who proclaim the gospel through word and sacrament and deeds of mercy to our teachers, to our servant leaders, our community leaders. We pray that through their service and their leadership that they may reveal your love for all people. Comfort and relieve, O Lord, all of those who are in trouble, who have deep sorrow, who suffer from poverty, sickness, grief, or depression. Heal them in mind, body, or circumstance, working in them by your grace wonders beyond all they may ever dream or hope. We lift up special prayers this day, O Lord, for the four Marines who lost their lives, for the shooter who killed them, for the confusion this causes in our world. We pray that hate will stop, that anything that could be a weapon be smashed into a plowshare so that seeds of hope are spread rather than the love of hate. And we pray this day, O Lord, in thanksgiving for our youth, for their leaders, We ask for blessings upon them, and we ask for blessings upon our girls' softball team. May they beat Fort Dodge if they play them. (laughs) May they be victorious, even in their losing, by playing for your glory, and may they enjoy their time. We pray all of these things in Christ's name. Now let us pray as Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I'm going to just take a minute or two and talk about something from the 175th Anniversary Committee. And today we're going to talk about pews. And it's pretty short, but I thought maybe to make it more relevant, I'd ask, you, you can show your hand or you can have a mental hand, is that called? A mental okay. Hand okay, but I like this kind of hand. Okay, so how many of you guys usually sit in the same pew or near the same pew? Nice and high. Okay, so this is going to be pretty interesting. I was doing a little research, and I have been to the Old North Church, and I'm sure a lot of you have been there in Boston. And, of course, Paul Revere has his, his own pew, and Samuel Adams, and, and all you know, sh- uh, ship captains, and just people usually that had, had a lot of money or um, prestige in the community. But even George Washington had his own pew, and kings and queens all over Europe and their names were on them, and they would be handed down to the next generation so everybody could have their pew. And it was really rare for a woman to have a pew. Um, And there was one or two examples of when the husband died, then the woman would be bequeathed that pew. And so they'd kind of look at her like, hey, what are you doing down front? You don't belong here without your man. But anyway, um, and then up in um, in the balcony, 
in the North Church. That would be for poor people to sit up there during the services, or uh, slaves, or free freemen. But everybody else had to pay for their pew. So, aren't you glad you don't have to pay for your pew? It's pretty awesome. So this is this is kind of neat. Um, this is um, well, it just talks about what happened in 1857, and that's I think the only we were looking for other uh, instances where pews were paid for. But this is the one we did find. It says in early times too, the pews were rented, and the money collected in this way went to church expenses and the minister's salary. Hey, pretty cool. <laughs> so like cough it up, right? Yeah. In several of the congregational minutes, I noted that the trustees expected to raise $1,200 from the rental of pews, but I could not find anywhere the record of their actually receiving that amount. However, I did find this among some old church papers, and this is in quotes, For and in consideration of $150, we the undersigned trustees of the First Presbyterian Church in the town of Mount Pleasant, Henry County, Iowa, do hereby sell, assign, and transfer, and convey to John Irwin or to his heirs and assignees pew number 23 in the church building belonging to said church and warrant him the peaceable possession and occupancy of the same so long as the present building is occupied as a church. In testimony whereof we have set our names here to this 22nd day of August 1857. Signed, James Craig. Were you there? <laughs> uh, Samuel Ross and U. B. Swan. This conveyance was acknowledged before a notary. Of course, there were some free pews. Every seventh one was reserved for the stranger or for those who were not able to pay the required amount. Wow. And we're still here, so they must have... I don't know, lack, maybe more lax as they went along. Okay, thank you. So we thought it would be fun, the 175th Anniversary Committee thought it would be fun to do that right before we asked for the offering. <laughs> so do consider the generosity of our Lord Jesus Christ, who though he was rich, for our sakes became poor. With gratitude for the grace of our Lord, let us offer the gifts of our lives back to God.
So our friends have come forward as an offering of their lives to God as we plan to go equip them to be aware and awake and, and see God's presence at work. Would you please turn and face your congregation, your family of faith? Please join me in the litany of commissioning. Throughout his earthly ministry, Jesus could be found feeding the hungry, healing the sick, and taking care of those in need. Jesus tells his disciples to continue this ministry with the simple word, be my sheep. This week, a group of youth and adults from our church will go to the Global Village at Howell Nature Center, Howell, Michigan, to learn firsthand about how to carry out that ministry of feeding the hungry in our complex world. Congregation. Amen. You may be seated. Please stand and sing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Let us pray. Generous God, we give you thanks for all your blessings to us. Use these gifts we offer as a sign of your great love for the world, so that all may know and share the abundance of your grace. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Friends, having joy is a form of prayer. So may you go from this place and know joy from the deepest sorrow where you can find comfort and grief to the highest high of being victorious and going to state. Go with the love of God. 
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Alleluia. Amen.